while I was on vacation, y'all lost the air conditioning here one Sunday. Um, <clears throat> that same Sunday just happened to be that Satan was standing out on the front stairway snickering while y'all were in here sweating and singing and praying and preaching. And a passerby came by and asked Satan if any of what you were doing in here bothered him. And with a demonic sneer, Satan said, nah, that's, it's just a little habit they've acquired. Now, Satan's a fool. If I asked you, what would be the greatest habit that you and I could cultivate in life? What would you say? If I asked you, what's the most important thing you're going to do this entire week? What would you tell me? Well, the answer to both of those questions is what you and I are doing right now, worshiping Almighty God. Bill Gates once said that 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings is the most wasted hour in America. Well, like Satan, Bill Gates just does not get it. But the big question is, do you and I? This morning we begin a new sermon series with the overarching title of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christians. Reality is God has made you and me to be creatures of habit. There is so much chaos and confusion and change in the world. Imagine if you lived every day of your life totally differently. I mean, you'd go nuts. We need to cultivate habits that serve as handholds, guardrails, frameworks around which we can build our lives and help us navigate all of the craziness that's out there. And there are certain habits in the Christian life that you and I need to cultivate. Now, at the end of the series, you may say, well, none of these habits are mine, and if that's the case... I'm not saying you're not saved, I'm not saying that you're not a Christian, but I will say that you're most likely not an effective Christian. In 1983, in a balcony overlooking Central Park, Steve Jobs was trying to convince John Scully, who at that time was the CEO of PepsiCo, to come and join him in this newfangled world of personal computers. And Job said to Scully, he said, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water or do you want to come with me and change the world? And that's really the underlying question behind this sermon series. Do you and I just want to kind of rock along as Christians or do we want God to work in through our lives to literally change the world for his glory? Well, if you do... There are certain habits that you and I can cultivate that make us more prone to that possibility. And the first and the most important one is regular worship. I invite you now to turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 95. And let's take a look at verses 6 through 9 and see what we learned this morning about worship. But let's pray before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now hear God's word as we find it beginning to read at verse 6 of Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, May they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Look around you. 
What in the world? What in the world has become of us as a nation, a culture? It's now okay to lie as long as lying helps your side politically. Incivility and bullying is now an accepted part of public discourse. Morality is now based on economic impact rather than what's true and what's good. Life and death, human sexuality, have been devalued to animalistic levels. And so how are you and I, as, as Christians, to stay sane? How are we to navigate all of this in a faithful way? The late Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard once told the story of a thief who breaks into a jewelry store, except he doesn't steal anything. He simply rearranges all the price tags. That's exactly what's going on in the culture around us. This past week, Era Parshigan died. The Presbyterian coach of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish back in the 1970s. I have a Presbyterian pastor friend in California who is a diehard, radical, fanatical USC fan. And he tells me when his life gets disordered and things seem to get out of place, he plays a DVD of the 1974 Notre Dame-USC game. In that year, Notre Dame was ranked number five. They came into Pasadena to play the number six ranked Trojans. And Notre Dame jumps out into a quick 24-0 lead. And to all USC fans, it looked like the world was totally disordered and coming apart. My friend, even though he says, I know what's going to happen in the game, I still watch it, I still get excited, I jump out of my seat because the second half, USC runs off 49 unanswered points and wins the game. And my friend says, I watch that video, when I do, it, it puts everything back in order and all is once again right with the world. Well, there's a little bit of a parallel there, a parallel there between what my friend does and what happens to you and me when we cultivate the practice of healthy worship. When we come in here, the price tags begin to get put back in the right place. But let's see what this psalm has to say to you and me, what it reveals to you and me about worship this morning. The first thing the psalmist is saying to you and me in verse 6 is, let's get serious about worship. He says, come, let us worship. Okay, here we are. You know, there's a big difference between going to church and really worshiping. Those can be two different worlds. How about you this morning? Are you here just attending or are you worshiping? Well, the psalmist gets more serious as we go through verse 6. He says, come, bow down. Ooh, this is taking it to a different level. The Hebrew word there literally means to throw yourself prostrate on the ground in a posture of submissive surrender. I want you to ask yourself this question as you leave here this morning. In that sanctuary, did I surrender my life to Jesus Christ as Lord in that sanctuary? If you did, then you bowed down. You authentically worshiped. If you didn't, well, you were here, you attended, but you were probably up to something else. Then he takes it down another notch. He says, come, let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. On two of the Sundays of my vacation, Anne and Michael and I worshiped at Christ Episcopal Church where my dear friend and covenant brother, Pat Gahan, is the senior pastor. And at a, two or three times during the service, we knelt, we pulled out the kneelers, and we know it. And it's amazing how posture can impact our worship. I find it curious that the Bible gives three postures for prayer. Standing, lying prostrate on the ground, and kneeling. So what do we Presbyterians who pride ourselves on being biblical do? We sit. <laughs> Anybody for uh, putting kneelers in our 
cues. One thing you and I need to know about worship and realize is that there is no person on the planet that does not regularly worship. That's because God has made every person primarily to be a worshiping being. The word worship literally means to ascribe ultimate worth to something or someone. So everyone's a worshiper. Even atheists ascribe ultimate worth to something, maybe to themselves. And so life is not about whether you and I are going to establish a regular pattern of worship, but who or what we are going to worship. And so the psalmist reminds us in verse 6 that there is only one legitimate, authentic subject for our worship, and that is God, our maker. Anything else we worship is invalid. And he goes on to show us in verse 7 that this God is not some distant, far-removed deity out there. Now, in verse 7, he begins to use shepherd and flock language. A reminder to you and me that this almighty God who created us is not some deistic being way out there who wound the world up like a clock and set it aside to run on its own. No, he is our up-close and personal shepherd. A good shepherd knows his sheep. A good shepherd loves his sheep. A good shepherd knows each lamb and sheep by name. And what the psalmist goes on in verse 7 to emphasize is the importance, the cruciality of corporate worship. You know, I hope you cultivate, this is a sermon for another time, but I hope you cultivate in your life a daily habit of prayer and scripture so that you begin your day anchored because you're going to encounter all kinds of craziness, all the uh, rearranged price tags out there. And unless you get yourself anchored at the beginning of the day, you're liable to buy into that stuff. But that's another day. The psalmist here talks about regularly gathering as the flock of the shepherd. You know, one of the currently popular cultural mantras out there is well i'm spiritual but not religious do you all know what religious literally means it simply means connected that's all it means god did not design any of us to be lone ranger christians yeah we're to have our personal individualistic uh, quiet times but we need to cultivate a regular weekly habit of gathering as the flock of God, hearing God's word, praying, singing together. And as that happens, all the price tags begin to be put back in the right places. Well, the psalmist goes on in verse 8 to say, today, if you hear his voice, and that's a big if, this morning, right here, in the sanctuary, Almighty God is speaking to every one of you and to me personally through his word, through bread and wine, through hymns and prayers, maybe through the folks around you. Do you hear his voice? Did you know that the condition of your heart affects your ability to hear? At least in the spiritual realm it does. That's what the psalmist is saying in verses 8 and 9. He's saying that the chief enemy to authentic worship is a hard heart. And he points out two incidences that happened on the Exodus as the Israelites are being delivered by God out of Egyptian bondage. And he says the incidents happened at Meribah and Massa. At both of those places, the Israelites cultivated a hard heart against God. Now, you need to realize These two incidents happened only days after God brought them out of Egyptian slavery. Only days after they personally, visibly watched God separate the waters of the Red Sea. And days later, they're grumbling, 
belly aching, whining, demanding of God more signs and wonders to answer their presumptuous question of, is the Lord among us or not? Psalmist says, don't be like them. Don't cultivate a hard heart. The harder your heart is and mine, the less able we are to hear God's voice, the less able we are to authentically worship. Ask yourself this question. Am I more in tune with Facebook or God's book? That's probably going to be a barometer of the malleability of your heart. One of the important things about gathering together weekly as the body of Christ, as his flock, and worshiping together is as we do, our hearts become softer, more malleable, and our ears of faith become unclogged and we are better able to hear God speak to us. Like my fanatical USC pastor friend, as we worship weekly, we rehearse, we recall, we remember, we reorient our lives around the mighty acts of God, far greater than the 49 points that USC ran off against USC. I mean, against Notre Dame. And as we recall and rehearse the mighty acts of God in creation and at the cross, who God is as our maker, who God is as our shepherd, who did for us what we can't do for ourselves in the life, death, and bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, then all the price tags get put back in the right place and we're able to navigate life without buying into all the craziness that's out there. This morning, you are invited to come to this table as the flock, to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ with the shepherd at the Lord's table in a unique way and receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the Eucharist. You know what Eucharist means in Greek? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. You see, my friends, effective lives arise out of effective worship, and effective worship comes out chiefly from a heart that is thankful, a heart of gratitude. It ought to be gratitude that draws you and me to this place more than anything else. A thankful life is an effective life, thankful for Christ. The late Harry Ironside was dining in a restaurant one night by himself. Another man came into the restaurant who was by himself, saw Ironside sitting there, went over and said, uh, sir, looks like you're alone. I'm here by myself. I really don't want to eat by myself. May I join you? Ironside said, come on, be my guest. They sat down, looked at the menu. They ordered their meals. And while they were waiting for their food, they began to chit-chat and get to know each other. And then the waiter brought their food, and Ironside bowed his head and silently gave thanks for his dinner. After he'd finished, the other man said, do you have a headache? Ironside said, no, I'm fine. Um, are, is your meal not okay? Ironside said, looks pretty good. I'm, I'm getting ready to dig in. Why do you ask? The man said, well, a minute ago, I saw you close your eyes and hang your head, and I thought maybe you were sick, or maybe there was something wrong with your food. Ironside said, no, 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 I, I was just giving thanks to the Lord for my meal. And the other guy said, oh, you're one of those. Listen, I don't thank anyone for anything. I've earned all my money by the sweat of my brow. And when I sit down to eat, I just start right in. Do you understand? Ironside said, oh, yes, I do completely. You're, you're just like my dog. He does that too. <laughs> In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.